Well, John, in, in the beginning, um, why don't you give us a little bit about your name and, and uh, your early relationships with Terry and, and how you two got acquainted? All right. Uh, well, Fred, uh, I go back to the same neighborhood as Terry. Um, we grew up on the same street, Tennessee Avenue, which was just a little bit south of uh, Cleveland High School, probably within a mile of the, of the high school. Uh, I can't pinpoint exactly the time, exactly when I met him, but, you know, we're a small community, all the children riding their bikes and doing everything, playing out in front, playing ball and everything, uh, throwing a tennis ball off the, the stoop or the, 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 the stone stairs sure. that he had. We probably met up sometime uh, early on, four, five, six years old, but it might have even been at Scruggs School in uh, grade school where I really got to know him mm -hmm. uh, for the first time, which, which goes back very, very early, obviously, uh, in our lives. Uh, interesting street. We had a lot of very interesting guys on that street. Jerry Mosier was a friend that, uh, a guy that comes up uh, that I think about that, that played for St. Mary's High School. He was a football player and caught a winning touchdown pass when they won a city championship. Oh, yes. I remember that. I used to play with him all the time. You, you, we used to do the t very typical bicycle, Indians, Cowboys and Indians games, tag, hide and seek, all of these childhood games, which were great. Uh, so it was a very healthy neighborhood, very clean, very neat, all going to Scruggs School. And uh, that's basically it. I guess that would date us back to about 1950, 51 in that area. Yeah. Was there anything particular about Terry that you remember from those very early days about his uh, participation in the games and early sports and that sort of thing. Well, it, it, you know, if you're talking about going back to classroom activity and baseball sports in school early on, uh, we played on uh, a playgrounds that was asphalt, which I thought was very interesting. So we didn't we didn't have a, a sand lock, so to speak, or, or grass. We had a very very big back lot to uh, a grade school where we played softball mostly because a baseball is going to run forever. Mm -hmm. A softball is bad enough. Uh, but we played on these teams together. Uh, there really wasn't much of a pitching aspect involved here because it was like slow pitch softball. Uh, and when we played at recess time, it amounted to not so much softball with bats, but kickball. So I think no, Terry, yes. Terry and I were all involved with the kickball uh, dodgeball, remember that? Oh, sure. Did all that stuff, and and so really it was probably later on that I saw Terry play more baseball because you see, when later on when we went to to Cleveland High School, he was on a baseball team. I was running track. They would play, oddly enough, they would play baseball games as we were running track but practicing, not meets. Mm -hmm. But we would be working out and we were doing uh, wind sprints and, and you know distance running and so forth as practice. So we had to watch out for the baseball. Or we, we were going to get hit in the head. we right. fly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the way it happened. You had a cinder track and you had a baseball field. And I occasionally saw Terry pitching and so forth as I was working well, out. I distinctly you recall, remember that? Yeah. yeah, I distinctly recall... We had a very short right field at Cleveland. Yes. And the track uh, went right through the middle of right field, uh, and it was only about 175 or 200 feet from home plate to right. the track. That's right. So if you were running through right yeah. field, you yeah. were in serious jeopardy. Right. The right and left uh, lines, uh, you know, right field, left field, would go all the way down to the fence, the wrought iron fence, across the cinder track, which was not too much fun to fall on, i got to tell you. Oh, no. Because I did it a few times, and that's a good way to scrape up your knees and cut yourself pretty good because these were not padded tracks. This was like this was like falling on broken charcoal right. <laughs> with, yeah, with, jagged, with jagged edges, yeah. okay? So that wasn't so much fun. The, the center field went forever. So if you hit a ball to deep center field and it rolled and rolled, it probably rolled 450 or 460 yeah. feet, you know? 
to the to the farthest length. But but I watched him occasionally play play baseball there, uh, and and saw him pitch games and so forth, and, and watched the team of course, uh, as I was doing my thing out on field because we would work out every day after. We were dismissed at what, like three fifteen? Yes. We go to our lockers, change clothes, all of us and everything, get in our running outfits, and then we'd be on the track from three thirty until sometimes six o'clock. Mm-hmm. Two, three, and two and a half, three hours of working out. So, so Terry and I crossed paths several times uh, in grade school playing ball, which was which was in the in on the playgrounds. Mm-hmm. During the summer, Fred, we would play. Softball, or there were various forms. Okay, you had cork ball, you had bottle caps, you had tennis balls, you had wiffle ball, and you had softball. So you're playing this more than baseball back in the in the early '60s because the field of play lent itself right. to that that type of play. And I remember, I don't know what it's like nowadays to, to be a kid and play baseball. It's also organized, and they have set practices and everything. But, don't beat on the table. Oh, don't beat on the table. Am I making noise? It, it does. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but Sorry. Back in good. Back in those days, though, you would have to pl- spend your time in summers doing something. And what we did was play ball, not just for an hour or two, but literally five, six hours. Oh yes, this was a day long process. Oh, this was like nine in the morning until three in the afternoon. Right. I mean, this this was just incredible. So I think a lot of the, the young people back then and, and the guys I played baseball with, including Terry and a bunch of others, we we can be, be became very good ball mm-hmm. players, I think, all of us, because we played a lot of, lot of ball, and that's what you yeah. did. Now, you do know that for those not living in St. Louis, mm-hmm. your references to cork ball and bottle caps is going to be lost. So you might want to elaborate a little bit on yeah. what that means. Well, it, I think they're unique to uh, to St. Louis because I've talked about this in other cities, and people have no, they don't have a clue, they don't have no idea what I'm talking about. But but bottle caps back then, of course, off of beer bottles and and pop bottles, were always saved and thrown usually in a, a grocery bag, a brown paper bag, and you kept them by the hundreds and thousands. You would use a, a cork ball bat or a, a stick, maybe even a uh, an old handle off a broom, and you could curve that bottle cap, right? Oh yes. And and if you hit it, it was a miracle. It's not easy to it hit. It was also a hit. It was a hit. It was it. So it was a very simple game that didn't require any fielders. Basically, you could play with two guys, a pitcher and a hitter, and you picked up the bottle caps and saved them, the ones you could find and so forth. With cork ball. That was really pretty stylized because a cork ball, there really is a cork ball. It's like a miniature-sized baseball that's a leather-sewn, small miniature baseball, smaller than a baseball, bigger than a golf ball. Yes. Somewhere in that neighborhood with a real nice Louisville Slugger-type bat that would be very long and narrow. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Similar to a baseball fungo bat, but smaller. Right. Right, and maybe not even much thicker or, or, or anything bigger than a wiffle ball bat, but longer. Mm-hmm. But real wood, real real uh, right. ash probably that they would use. And that was interesting too because that's when you could have an outfielder, you could have a pitcher, you could have a catcher, mm-hmm. and you fired the ball in there. And, of course, it was. I think you honed a lot of skills that way by trying to hit these these particular uh Pitches. They were uh, difficult. They were difficult, and and did and Terry participate in the cork ball games? I, you know, I much? I can't remember. And I tell to tell you the truth, I I only probably did it a few times. More often, we probably wouldn't have the money to go out and buy this this these these bats and balls and everything. But a lot of times, you were using uh, tennis balls. Oh yes. That you that you would use as a or sponge rubber balls. Mm-hmm. I remember using a scrub school in the. And your backstop would be the building. Yes. Then you wouldn't have a catcher. Yes. The, so you're the, throwing something that won't break the brick that, or hurt anything. That game, of course, was called fuzzball. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Because of the fuzz on the tennis ball. Exactly. And you could hit the, a tennis ball with a regular bat or a thinner bat. You could hit it a mile. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, yes. And you would run bases on that sort of thing with maybe a narrower field. So, uh you know, I think Terry uh, did all of this and and was able to obviously hone some skills from a variety of things. Now, the first p- 
pitching experience, I, I think maybe this might be his earliest ever, goes back to when we were in grade school. We had a, a teacher by the name of uh, Miss Aller. You maybe might remember her. No, I, I did not and go to Scruggs. This was an, oh, that's right. Okay, this is Scruggs School, and it's a grade school, one through kindergarten through eighth grade. And Miss Aller would sit there at her desk and everything, and, of course, we'd, we'd have certain study hall type time. Now it's time to read this and do this, give you assignment, your writing, and so forth. Terry and I would take wads of paper off our notebook and chew them up and put them in our mouth. And we created a spitball. So I would see Terry take these pieces of paper and throw that curveball right past her head and hit the blackboard and stick to the blackboard. So I think that that was early recognition of Terry's fa fastball and curveball. I'm almost sure of it. What do you think? Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's likely. It, it, it's also an indication, I think, of uh, shall we say Terry's uh, less than serious, playful nature. Right. Uh, right. What was always amazing is the ambivalence. The the teacher would never notice. Either they didn't want to recognize what was going on, they really missed it, which we thought was hilarious because we'd be sitting back there giggling, right? We're laughing. Maybe they just didn't and, want to encourage it by acknowledging yeah. it happened. Yeah. Right. Right. Denial. If I don't say anything, <laughs> it didn't happen and they won't do it again. <laughs> the spitball would stick on the black Oh yes. Blackboard, which was black, Sometimes and not green. For days. Yeah. It would stick there all day until eventually it got hard and fell on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. See, we were doing that stupid kind of crazy stuff back then, but so much revolved around sports because uh, we grew up, growing up in St. Louis is to know, unlike maybe other cities, what a uh, fanatical St. Louis Cardinal city this is. Oh, yes. And so when you're growing up with the likes of uh, Stan Musial and Ken Boyer and Kurt Flood and, and Bob Gibson and on and on, all the way through 58, 59, 60s, the, the mid-60s when we were in high school, you, you, played, you played baseball more than anything. Probably second would have been basketball. And I don't even know if Terry played much basketball at all. We played pickup that, games mm -hmm. in high school, but nothing yeah. serious. Right. It would be two-on-two, two, basically. Yeah. That sort of thing. Did you participate in any of the basketball games later in the alley behind the house on Dewey? There, Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, we can get into that yeah. later. I, I, could yeah. you talk about uh, in the early childhood uh, on Tennessee, Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you relate or what did you know about Terry's parents? How, and how did you get along with them or what did you well, feel about that? I, I was in their home. Uh, I was invited into their home on Tennessee Avenue several times because I'm not sure how many doors down, but probably seven, eight doors away, seven, eight, nine doors down the street, down the block, so to speak, from us. And uh, I was invited in several times. And uh, I always remember Mrs. Jokum being really, really sweet. That's probably the best word for it. Really sweet, really kind, uh, you know, great, great personality and uh, really warm, warm person. Dr. Yoakum scared me. <laughs> Dr. Yoakum scared me because of a very strong personality and, and with, a, you know, an A personality and, and, uh, and I didn't see him that often or talk to him that much because it would mainly be in Terry's presence that Dr. Yoakum was talking or instructing him, Terry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm and you were I'm a little this reluctant in. to interrupt. Right. I'm a little reluctant to interrupt and I and and I wouldn't say a whole lot around him. Uh, because he could be a very intimidating man, not that that's bad. He was very strong. How do you think that may have shaped Terry's personality? Well, it, it's everything, probably. It's probably everything. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of, of Dr. Dr. Yoakum in, in Terry uh, because of the fact that he wasn't shy or retiring. Terry, <laughs> Terry was not shy in, in school either, uh, in grade school or high school. Uh, 
he was outspoken and uh, got into a lot of mischief and a lot of trouble at times. Um, not that it was really bad stuff. It's it's not even comparable to what happens nowadays in high schools oh, no. or colleges. Oh no, no, not at all. It was silly little stuff, the chewing gum type stuff. Were were you uh, were you present at Scruggs School when Mrs. Booth became the substitute teacher and asked Terry to leave the class? I heard about that. You were you there in the class? No. I don't think I would, no, because I, I didn't have Mrs. Booth. I see. I didn't have Mrs. Booth as a teacher, and uh, and I, fr I told her, I was frankly, I was very relieved that I didn't have her for a She scared me. She was probably one of the toughest teachers in the school. Probably a good thing. Yes. Right? Very good, very good, very strong teacher, and, and what we need. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. She scared kids back then, though, and I, I had another teacher in math, and I heard about it and everything, but what I remember about Terry in those days, Fred, it just, just isn't that incident. It was several different things of being maybe in trouble in class for talking or chewing gum or causing some commotion, you know, pushing people back and goofy stuff like that where Terry and, and sometimes me, sometimes some others, but what I noticed about Terry it was always like, what? You're you're talking to me, I I didn't do anything. I don't I don't understand this. I'm innocent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Almost he, almost you know to what? the point oh. of oblivious to the chaos he's creating. Well, he created and he acted. Yeah. So he had this outgoing personality. But that he was, was oblivious just, to the impact. Right. Well, I got the impact. And what I got out of the impact, and the teacher got the same impact, is that you've got to be kidding me. Your acting is so bad, you're as guilty as sin. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because he'd have this look on his face, gee, I don't, I don't understand what I did. What did I do wrong? And it's, everybody's looking at him like, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get away with He had a bad poker face. Okay? Yeah. Bad poker face. Uh, had him dead to rights. So that happened a number of times. It's hard for me to recall the incidents, but I mean, it must have happened five, six different times when we got in various shenanigans and we're going to the principal's office or you're kicked out of gym class. Oh, yeah. Or something like that along those lines for goofing off. You're not paying attention. Little things like that. And, and you know what? Terry, Terry was involved in a lot of that stuff. And he was yeah. usually the instigator, you know what? Oh yes, Terry, yes. Terry, if you're listening, you know, he, uh, yeah, he was usually the rabble rouser, the well, guy behind a lot of shenanigans. Well, John, you you go back uh, much further in Terry's history than I do. Um, my name is Fred Weissman, and I did not get involved with Terry until either late in the freshman year or early in the sophomore year of high school. Oh boy. And I am relatively convinced that even though I, I played baseball um, on Cleveland's B team, the freshman team, uh, and of course Terry was loath to come down to that level and insisted on playing varsity or nothing, <laughs> uh, our paths did cross. But I believe that Terry did not take much notice of me until I got my first car, <laughs> which is represented by this uh -huh. red and white 55 Chevy, which is an exact replica, uh, which Terry thought was one of the better looking cars, and he wanted to be seen in that car. So he cultivated a friendship, which has endured to this day. Uh, but we went on many, many double dates right. in that car. And, you know, Terry would be in the back seat with his date trying his best to score and, <laughs> to my knowledge, rarely succeeding, but it never thwarted his efforts any. He kept trying. Uh, he didn't have a car at that time himself, no, did he? No, 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 and that's... He, he always double-dated, and he double-dated with myself also. I had a car, yes. and I had a 55 Chevy. Yes. And and yet, 
and, and there, yours was beautiful, and I remember the cars you had, but he, he was usually asking, well, you want, you, want a, you want a double date on Saturday night? <laughs> yeah, you drive. He needed a ride. Yeah, that's because <laughs> Doc wouldn't give him uh, the car. Right. And at that time, if you remember the cars that Doc had, uh, he had that big Pontiac Catalina. I remember that. And yep. then he got that 1960 Chevrolet six-cylinder automatic mm. that Terry wouldn't be caught dead in oh. because that, yeah. you know, that was Bush League car. He, right. he didn't like that. He had no style, which he was right. It didn't. Right. I remember a Ford. Well, Ford, that came Ford later. Fairline, yeah, Fairline that came later car. in life. Doc had a friend who <laughs> owned an auto body shop out in Crestwood, and he would mm. get cars that this guy would buy and restore, mm. and, and they were usually pretty good. And yeah, he, he came up with a 1957 Ford Fairlane, uh, mm -hmm. and it had a V8 in it. Beautiful. So Terry was was satisfied to drive that around, but it still wasn't his car. Right. So he, he wanted a little more freedom. So he got a number of us, you, me, Alan Doughty had his own car. Right. Uh, Bill Rusin had access to mm -hmm. a car. Mm -hmm. So we became the unofficial uh, chauffeurs. Designated uh, double now, daters. The sad yeah. thing is, uh, this car being uh, my first car and still one of my two or three pride and joy cars in my lifetime, soon this car no longer satisfied Terry. And this is true. I was perfectly content and blissful in my ignorance, <laughs> but Terry decided that because my car was in fact a six-cylinder, it was not quite up to standard. So Terry began his relentless pursuit of me acquiring a V8. So we scoured the local car lots until we discovered a 1957 Chevrolet with a 283 V8 engine mm -hmm. and a stick shift on the column. Now this car was not a top-of-the-line model. It was in those days uh, referred to as a 210. This was a four-door sedan with posts. Right. Not particularly yeah. attractive. Hit no nowhere near the looks of this car, but Terry was emphatic this car had a v8 and it was fast mm -hmm. and we had to have it not me we yeah. had to have it <laughs> so terry browbeat me and browbeat me and then began working on my father that it was okay to trade this 55 chevy in on the 57 chevy now, why my father fell for this, I still to this day do not know. But he fell for this line. So we promptly traded off the perfectly functional 55 for right. this 57 and began our South St. Louis racing career <laughs> where Terry wanted to win every race and we began uh, racing everyone in sight. So that that continued well into uh, high school until I decided that this 57 Chevrolet was not the chick magnet that I wanted it to be. So then I convinced my father, independent of Terry, to get rid of this 57 Chevrolet and I bought a, I believe, a 61 Ford Starliner, which was a very attractive car. Mm. But in terms of speed it everything the 57 was this was not this was a sluggish low gear ratio oh. I mean it, top you know 0 to 60 was probably 3 days so <laughs> that I think that broke Terry's heart when I when I did that right. but I decided that it had to be done uh, but you know in in the high school days that I knew Terry uh, there were any number of things that we did my recollections in those days uh, a lot of it did center around our cars 
uh, if it wasn't baseball, it was cars. And mm -hmm. Terry would organize these car cleaning sessions at his house every Saturday, which you took part in a few of those. Uh, yeah, we were talking about that earlier, and I remember those, and I remember being invited over. And I, I didn't live exactly that close to Terry. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like down the street or two blocks away. I was a little bit further, not that far, mm -hmm. but maybe two miles, two and a half miles yeah, away. Yeah, well, I was married about five blocks. Yes, and I and I would wash my own car every weekend and and polish it and and get the used to paint, take Tester's white paint and paint the names Goodyear or Atlas or whatever it was on the tires. So you could have your own raised white letter tires. Right, and yes. it was, so it was a self-done job. And then be very careful when you washed them, said you were using uh, some sort of a comet. They didn't have the non-abrasives back then. In the early days, right. they had the comet or, or, or something like the Ajax. But you'd have to be very careful when you wash it well, off. That would, that would whiten them up again because yes. it would start to turn yellow. Right. Remember? Oh, so, yeah. So we, I did that. And anything to make the car look better than, than what it was. But I remember you guys doing that. I really do. I can almost picture it now. But a lot of times I didn't do that because mm -hmm. one hour my car was already taken care of. I did it whenever. But I, I knew how Terry was. You know, Terry's very good at having what you would obviously uh, dictate as, as uh, having other people do this. He would... Yes. Right? He would delegate. And that's exactly he would what delegate. these Why don't you take care of those tires over there? And, and Fred, why don't you go back? The windows. You know, the windows need... Yes. And he would delegate the responsibilities as Terry would kind of play supervisor. Yes. Yes. And that it, didn't it, fool me. Well, it, it, <laughs> so. it, it didn't fool a number of us. It's just that the, the getting together and getting your cars cleaned and shooting the breeze on a Saturday morning right. and stuff uh, was sufficiently entertaining that his manipulative uh, tactics <laughs> didn't really deter us from showing up. And I doing never it really anyway. saw Terry wash his own car. I did once. There, there was one day when I was the only one that showed up, and I'll be damned if I was going to wash his car for him while right. he sat his fat ass right. on his steps. I made him come down and help. Right. That wasn't going to happen. Uh, but normally, yeah. yeah, he he would just disappear. Well, the, I think he went in and got a coke or something right. while we washed his yeah. car for him. Yeah. Well, see, I w I was glad that uh, this gets off the subject a little bit, but not that that much. I was glad Terry was a pitcher, and I thought that was perfect for him to be a pitcher in high school, because um, Terry was not the fastest of runners. Okay. In spite of his protestations, you're right. He he was kind of a slow runner. Speed was not one of his assets. So learning to throw. The proper pitch at the the proper time with the right velocity, speed, mm -hmm. change ups, and everything was a smart move. I think basically because he wasn't going to be a Lou Brock and uh, steal no. a lot of bases. No. Uh, so, but but that was just the way Terry was. In the way he still moves to this day, he's not the the fast walker I am. I've always been a fast walker. Terry's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Terry kind of walks slowly across the room. And I think most people who know him know that. He's not in a big hurry. Well, you know, not a, never in a big hurry. You do realize that by him walking slowly gives the audience more opportunity to see him. Exactly. If you get from point A to point B quickly, yes. you limit your exposure. Yes. Which is yes. not the desirable yeah. thing. Do you think he's... Do you think he's really figured that out? I wouldn't I think put that's it a past game. Do you think that's a game plan? I, I would not put that FaceTime. Yes. FaceTime. Yes. Okay. Face well, time I, didn't, I, had, like, I, thought, I hadn't thought about it, but yeah, that's that's probably true. You know, uh, I'm here, and I want to give you, because I am a magnanimous person, I want to give you every, every opportunity to see me. So don't move too quickly. Yeah, and he must have learned that early on because, uh, again, prior to you ever meeting with Terry, he, he always had the slow gait mm -hmm. about him in, in even grade school. 
and you know grades two, three, four, five, that sort of thing. <laughs> and so he, I don't think he was ever going to win any any running contests. No. But again, that the the good part about that is that he picked the right position, not third base, not shortstop. Correct. Yes. You know, not an outfielder. He he became a pitcher. He knew where his talents mm -hmm. were. And he, he exposed them, exploited them, and that's smart. During I don't want to be too cruel on him, Fred. I mean, well, I leave that to you. you. Know, I, and I, I will <laughs> certainly do that. Um, later on in high school, mm. how much opportunity did you really have to associate with him? Uh, obviously, you didn't play baseball in high school. Did you play ball in any other summer leagues with him or, or? no actually I, I I actually did not I uh, I limited my baseball activity in teams to just the basics of growing mm -hmm. up and and playing sandlot I wasn't on the high school baseball team I didn't do the extra uh, Legion American Legion, mm -hmm. Legion baseball and the other sponsor teams and everything I didn't do any of that um, for me personally, at that point in time, toward the end of high school, I was looking really looking ahead to going to college, and and actually leaving town, mm -hmm. and and you know just going to another university, another school away from home. So I was I was looking toward the future, you know, obviously. But uh, but Terry and I had me the most part of our dealings were often off and on, off and on periodically and then even when I would return for Christmas from college mm -hmm. uh, I would see him over the holidays and we would get together uh, there were some times when we we went to some dances and did some dating in the uh, latter part of the 60s 67 68 that sort of thing mm -hmm. so then then after that there was an absence for a long long time approximately 20 years how did you get back together? Well, this is this is a pretty wild story. I, my wife and I, uh, Lynn, uh, we live in Cincinnati, and uh, my mom was very ill, and we came in, but it coincided with a high school Cleveland high school reunion. This was 1990 in the latter part of June, as I recall. It's hot, but it's nice weather. Uh, we come into town to see my mom, but there's also that that tie in with the mm -hmm. reunion. Well, I had talked about Ted Drew's frozen custard to my wife for ever since I knew her. And at that point, I had known her about four or five years. We'd been married a year. So we come into town this late at night. We actually took off after work, so five, five and a half hour drive from Cincinnati got us in the, into St. Louis like at 10.30 at night. And we made a beeline for Ted Drew's on South Grant near Cleveland High. And we pull in a lot. We get our frozen custard. My wife goes wild over it. Of course. Loved it. Loved it instantly. Pineapple concrete is her favorite. I get my hot fudge sunda. And I'm looking around at the lot and look at all the people. My gosh, is it busy. Look, this is what it's like, Lynn, at 10, 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night. It's unbelievable. And I see this Corvette. And, uh, but I'm looking at it and I say to her, and this is really a very accurate, true story. I, that lady there in that car looks really familiar. I mean, God, I can't believe what I'm looking at here. I'm going to walk a little bit closer because I'm, we're about 50 feet away or so. And I recognized before Terry, I recognized his mom mm -hmm. sitting in the car. And then I looked at this guy and I, gee, I hate to say this. I feel, I said to my wife, I said, I wonder who, I wonder if that's Dr. Yoakum, that old man sitting next to him. I guess that's Dr. Yoakum, but I remember him as being bald. <laughs> and then I see all this white hair. I wonder who that guy is with her. It's true. And I, so I, she walks alongside me, my wife, and we walk up to him and I try to angle myself around the corner, take a look. And I said, my God, it's Terry Yoakum. So before I do anything, I, I, I said, Lynn, Lynn, you won't believe this. I went to school with this guy. I've known this guy since like five years old. I, I can't believe what's happening here. Said, really? Is that is that right? And I said, yeah, I've got to, you know, I've got to pull an ambush on him. So he's talking to another young guy, I think, somebody, stranger, talking about the car. The guy wants to know about the Corvette mm -hmm. and what it is and what year and all that stuff. I kind of come up behind him 
and say, you know, boy, this, this car is really actually a piece of junk. Well, you should have seen his head spin around. Ah, ah, what? Ah. Are you kidding me? And then he sees who I am. Then he recognizes me instantly and just cracks up. And his mom, I think, knew me at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that started a relationship again that's gone on from since 1990, June of 90, through now. And with other reunions and other oh, gifts. Sure. And so this relationship uh, has been wonderful because he's had the opportunity to travel and come into Cincinnati and do lectures where we lived and stay with us, my wife and I. So he's known her, actually... Almost as long as me. Oh my he's known goodness. her since he's known my wife Lynn since 1990, because we met in '86, and so that's renewed. That renewed everything, and uh, along with it, the cars, the baseball, mm -hmm. uh, the lectures. Uh, he coming into town and doing some very, very, very big lectures in the greater Cincinnati area with hundreds of chiropractors showing up, and us joining him and seeing some of the lectures, and then going out to dinner afterwards or whatever, he stayed at our house. So that was really kind of just dumb luck. You know, it's it's what my wife would say was meant to be. Oh, yes. See, yeah. it's, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. It's going to happen. And that was one of those circumstances where if he wouldn't have been there at that time on a Friday night, and if I wouldn't have noticed that Corvette, and if I wouldn't have walked over and gotten a better angle to see who he was, yeah. We probably still would not have connected, uh, and it'd be forty years instead of twenty. Wow, that that's. But a, it was it was a, it was a hoot. It yeah. was really a hoot. Yeah. How? <laughs> how did you get acquainted with Billy Davis? Well, Bill Davis uh, is a person that I didn't know at all until he actually came to. Goodyear, Arizona, which is outside, 20 miles west of Phoenix. Which, which is where which you is where moved we after, yes. after Cincinnati. That's right. And we moved there uh, six years ago. 2001, we moved to Goodyear, Arizona, and we're still working. But, but we live at a, a community called Pebble Creek, which was just wonderful. And I had boasted about it to Terry, and I said, you got to tell your friends about it. It's, it's just great. There's, there's golf, there's tennis, there's fitness centers, pools, great weather. You know what it's like in Arizona. And so he brought a contingent of people, friends, which we were happy to have a get-together and have a cookout. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I ever met Bill Davis is when he came in with his wife, Linda, and was interested. It seemed like every party in the group was interested in buying a home out there. They were all kind of turned on and excited about this mm -hmm. semi-retired adult community, but was very active, young adults, not, not, uh, not young adults, but young seniors, yes. let me put it that way, not, not 75, 80 years old, but people who were like 40 and 50 years old. Some of them still working, some of them retired. Nah. So it, it turned them all on, and Bill was really interested then in, in seeing our home and, and seeing the models. And so they spent several days there. We had a dinner, we went out to dinner, we showed them uh, everything out there at, that, that the West Valley of Phoenix has to offer and so forth, and that started and I guess that was probably no more than four or five years ago, maybe 2002 in okay. that area, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's how I got to know him. And then I learned all about the umpiring and the baseball, and, and, and I knew about Terry's passion for baseball, which is kind of carrying over to umpiring. Yes. As an extension of being on the field, Good. now umpiring games and learning from Bill, who's who uh, well, an interesting story about Bill Davis is the fact that just two a couple of years ago wasn't that long ago, you know he got a great university out there in Phoenix ASU Arizona State. Sure, they were in a national championship playing Texas, and he was the umpire by an own plate in the final game, which became a very controversial game because there was a pop up. Uh, I actually know the catcher and his mom and dad. Uh, his name's Go Goswitch. And he ran over to the sideline after this foul ball in fair territory, but somebody reached over. Uh, I don't even think I saw the tape, but maybe once on highlights. But there was an interference call, and, and uh, Bill called the batter out. And the other team, Texas, thought there was a, there was a, it was not fair. Uh, 
it, they thought it was a bad call. Actually, it was the right call. But what happened was Texas, because they got so upset about it, rallied and won the World Series. That's kind of the bottom line. <laughs> <Gee>. <laughs> because even though the call went in favor of ASU, Texas it, came back it to win. Texas it motivated Texas. It got them so hyped up and upset because they thought they were cheated that they won the, won the World Series on a couple of home runs. I mean, it was mm -hmm. a fantastic game on ESPN. So uh, that's when I got to see uh, Bill Davis in action because I had not seen mm -hmm. him umpire back when Terry saw him right. years and years and years ago. And obviously it's a superlative umpire, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in college baseball. I mean, you have to be you have to be good to be behind home plate for the World Series. Oh, absolutely. In college baseball. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And that's how I know him, and I, we've known him uh, uh, as, as uh, peripheral friends of Terry's okay. for the last several years. Well, I have, you know, obviously I have some different uh, experiences with Terry uh, going all the way back to high school. Uh, we did play ball together in high school. Uh, we played on a couple of uh, non-high school amateur teams, mm -hmm. uh, Watterson Boys Club and maybe one or two others. Um, I had a little bit different approach to the game than Terry. I played it for fun. You know, I, I had some talent and I probably could have been more successful than I was, but I just played it for fun. Right. I, I didn't uh, have the passion and the drive and the direction that Terry had. Um, I would just as soon go out with a bunch of guys and play a pickup game mm -hmm. as a structured game. I, I didn't care as long as I was playing something. And you know, I I liked baseball, but I was just as happy playing football or basketball or you know something else. Where Terry was, as you know, way more focused on baseball. Right. Um, But I, I met, you know, I met Billy, uh, I believe, the summer after we graduated, but I really didn't get to know him until I went down to Cape to visit Terry, and Bill, of course, was his roommate. And that's mm -hmm. when they became quite close. When you live in the same room with someone for two years, you, you get a little, oh, yeah. uh, a little acquainted. And uh, they, of course, have been uh, very close friends. Uh, since then, uh, Terry uh, came in and out of my life in, in a little bit different fashion than he did yours. Uh, when Terry met Inga, I, of course, shortly thereafter met Inga, and uh, as things evolved, uh, that was during a period when Terry and I were, were more closely involved and of course I was invited to be the best man in his wedding and of course his parents had no grandchildren at that time so they basically adopted my son Bob ah. he was like their surrogate grandchild until they got one of their own mm -hmm. and, and I think Terry's father uh, really just enjoyed being around my son. So he was invited to be the ring bearer in the ceremony mm -hmm. and uh, that went well and of course then when Terry got married he left for Chicago and going to school right. and right. this that and the other and, and our paths separated and then he would come back to town for a while and we would hook up and then he would separate and uh, you were always a lot, it, it was always a relationship that's been more constant instead of big, long gaps. Yeah. It was there, probably there were more gaps, frequent than what I most, experienced. Most of the gaps yeah. be, came because Terry would leave town, either to go to Chicago mm -hmm. or go to Australia or right. move to Denver. But most of the time when he came back to St. Louis, uh, I would fit in somewhere. Right. Uh, you know whether it was for just a couple of hours on an afternoon mm -hmm. or or we would get together and spend a day or two uh, it was in and out and uh, but Terry and I had a, a little 
a little bit uh, different relationship uh, in a number of these interviews and, and in your own experience uh, you've known Terry to be a rather headstrong uh, opinionated uh, knows what he wants knows what he wants to accomplish kind of guy and as we've previously talked about he was very good at figuring out what he wanted others to do mm -hmm. well in my own way I, I guess I have a rather stubborn streak on occasion <laughs> uh, not quite as verbal about it as Terry but uh, there have been times when Terry would push to my limit <laughs> No. And, yeah. You're kidding. <laughs> and, you know, and in a relatively firm and sometimes not too gentle way, I, I would let him know that that was as far as I was going to go, and I either was going to do what I was going to do, or I wasn't going to do what he wanted me to. But, you know, I, I don't know that it has ever damaged our friendship. Uh, it's just I let Terry know that this was not what I was going to be pushed into and he could like it or he could not like it but that's the way it goes that's the you way know? It is. and uh, <laughs> I think we've been able to maintain a, a fairly healthy relationship uh, over the years because of that um, you know I, I've made Terry aware that uh, I'm very happy for his successes. I, I think I've probably been over the years a little more familiar with what's going on in his professional life than perhaps you were. Yes. Uh, I'm very happy for his successes, uh, but not to the point of being jealous or, or overly envious or wishing him anything ill because of it. Right. Uh, I, I think that based on what he does for a living sometimes he has to be as pushy as he is because his career is based on recognition you can't dwell in obscurity and do what he's done and, and would you agree with I that? agree well I, I agree with that uh, I uh, Terry is aggressive and uh, strong will and uh, and uh, what he feels adamant about, uh, I don't think anybody can change his mind. If he's made up his mind about something, he will get a variety of different opinions, but he will forge ahead mm -hmm. and still make his own decision and do what he needs to do. I think that's all well and good, but anybody, I think, that has a great passion for whatever it is, yes. whether it's baseball or football or basketball or being a chiropractor, being a radiologist, or, or, or even a doctor. There are other doctor friends that I have that are so dedicated to being oncologists or, or, or doctors that I know one gentleman's over 70 years old, which is quite a bit older mm -hmm. than Terry right now. And that's just, this is all he does. He's at the hospital almost every day. And he's very dedicated. This all were very wonderful, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, you know, this man's not going to retire. There's got to be more to life than that. I, I mean, I understand he loves what he's doing, and he's saving people's lives, and he's, he's doing surgeries and, and getting rid of cancer in a lot of people, and that's, that's fantastic. But, you know, it's, it, how much can you do for how long at, at 10 hours a day yeah. at that age? And... It's the old, like in your yard back here, you've got a sign that says, stop and stop, smell the roses. Mm -hmm. I saw that sign. Now, that's, been, that's an old quote, and people have been saying that for years. But it really is very true yes. that you can still be passionate about something, but I think it's very important to set time aside where uh, you've, you've got to go skiing or go play golf or do something. Now, Terry's done these baseball tournaments. I understand that. But it, I don't but, think but it's a lot the of same time, thing. But it's not quite. It, a lot of times, it ties into a, a lecture circuit, so so there, it's always crossing over the lecture with the baseball or with the umpiring, or something something along those lines instead of a just flat out uh, 
complete vacation. Do you get, do you get the uh, sense that Terry is so driven to excel at baseball and now at our age is sensing the decline in his skills that even that isn't a relaxation? I, I don't think that he ever relaxes at anything. He's always got multiple irons in the fire. I don't too think, many things going on at the same time. I don't think Terry's a relaxed person. No. At anything. No. I don't think he was relaxed knowing him the way he was back in high school and pitching in high school. I don't think he was relaxed then. I think it was I agree. intense. Very. See? And and I don't know whether you say that that's passion or whether that's just being intense. Uh, I Do you think any of that stems from his desire to live up to some standard in his mind, whether it's real or artificial, but in his mind it's real, some standard that his dad set or that he's yeah, trying when, to live up to? I, I not live up to, but go way beyond. I think there's a there's a pride factor uh, even, even after his uh, father's passed on and his mom's passed on uh, and his sister and his whole family. I think, uh, I think he number one he wanted to ple not only please his father but but make him so extremely proud that it's way it's over the top. Mm -hmm. It's way beyond. Uh, it's hitting the most home runs yes. and being the all-time uh, home run hitter, mm -hmm. like Bonds passing up right. Hank Aaron, right? Uh, Mary Barry Bonds' father, Bobby Bonds. Want he wanting to show his dad that he could go way beyond what he did, although he was successful. Sure, I think there's part of that. I think it's part of that he really loves what he what he's doing. I think it's part of uh, he loves the fact that he can help people. Definitely, and and and, and be uh, uh, a lifesaver for many people, or at least give them some information they can use mm -hmm. that will lead to a better life. So I think that the, that the care and the love factor here plays into it along with the passion that he likes what he's doing and, and, and trying to be somebody special in his family, go way beyond, you know, what, what, he, what his father maybe would have seen. Mm -hmm. I, I guess his father could have been said, well, you're going to be a chiropractor for, just like me. Good for you. Great. Mm -hmm. but, but Terry carried it on and on and on, yes. way, 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 way beyond. If you want to do that, that's great. Uh, but, but I hope uh, he's having a good time along the way, because y you want to live your life, and do, by the time it comes to an end, you don't want to have it. You know. Have you ever it's really gone. seen Terry, where you have had a sense that he really is having a good time with no strings attached? Well, he's having a good time, not necessarily. I don't think when he, his work is work and his lectures are lectures and his book and his re writing and editing his book is one thing. Uh, he has a good time when he's dancing. He has a real good time when he's listening to oldies rock. Uh, there's no question about that. He, he gets great pleasure out of talking about old friends and old remembrances and old stories. Well, speaking, these are the hot buttons that turn yeah, him on. <laughs> speaking of old friends and remembrances, do you find that he will insist well, that you know right? someone or yeah, some event that he knows <laughs> And he insists that you were part of it, and you know this, and you have no clue what he's talking about. You know, I, I, well, I find that yeah, happens to yeah. me all the time. And see, I, I thought it was only me. No. I thought it was just me. Time out. We're out of film, out of tape. Okay. <laughs> How long have we been, anyway? It's been not long enough. It's been an hour and a half. Uh, hour, it's been an hour. Over an hour, oh, hour and twenty minutes. We got a couple of more places to go. Because I, I, I'll tell you, I'll continue this though. We can pick up on this because yeah. it's funny uh, as the way you see it and I see it. Is this any good? You think this good? Oh, this is great. You think it's okay compared to the others? The other tapes that you've got, they're all good. They're all good. They're all good. They're all different. They're all different. Be, yeah, sure. Which is the whole point. Which they should be. Yeah, they should be.
This man's got to be tired. Yeah, if everybody said exactly the same thing, what a dull book it would be. Right. And what a dull tape it would be. It'd be just a montage of the same old, same old. That's why I was sitting here drifting, and I apologize for that. Are we ready? That's all right. Are we up to speed? We got, uh, I'll tell you what, since we broke, let me go ahead and stop this. Yeah, we got rambling on, and, yeah, and there's a number of areas yet to cover. Two tapes, okay. so, uh, yeah, we're, we've got about 25 minutes on these, these two tapes. Okay, so that's our, perfect. Uh, At that point, right. we'll either probably right. another tape. Yeah. finish by then. Right. Or, uh, you ought to re ask that question. Probably so will be able to wrap back, it up. And t- uh, you ought to re ask that question. So we're back exploring the fact that Terry. I know has done, done this to me now. any number of times. I know sure he's, he's done, done it to others, people, and I, I, we're sh- I'm sure he's done it to you, where he will recount a person, mm-hmm. a place, an event, and, you know and insists that you took part in it and you know and what happened or who this person is. What he's talking about. And I right. frequently do not uh, know if you're what asking he's me talking if I have about. The same experience, right. Uh, if you're asking me if I have the same experience, uh, my answer would be, uh, I thought I was the only one this happened to. For years, no. Uh, this is funny, Fred, because for years I've been telling my wife Lynn about the fact that you know Terry's mentioned this person and this person and this person, and about this story, and I don't. I'm, I think I'm getting some Alzheimer's or something. I'm thinking, no, that. I don't now, remember I that. In fact, I know I didn't know those so people. Now, I think part of it is because he played on baseball teams and so forth, and he thought maybe I was around or, or at the games or on the team or something around it. Uh, or, or at school, in the hallways, in a class. Yes. There are a lot of, when you're in high school, you know, you're not taking classes. With, I don't even think I had that many classes with Terry after grade school. But in high school, I think we, we all kind of split up and did, I was with a lot of new strangers. Yes, me too. I had, I had different friends and a lot of new friends besides Terry and meeting you through Terry right? and other things. And But I knew Paul Clay and I knew a number of other folks. That, you know, that I went to grade so-and-so school and with, okay? So then when Terry says, well, do you know so-and-so, and you remember her, and... Well, frequently and, he will preface it with, you remember so-and-so, or you were at such-and-such, and you don't have any idea no, what he's talking no, about. No, and I tell him the truth, I say... I didn't know him, Terry. What? And it astonishes him that you don't know him. I didn't know him, Terry. And it astonishes him that you don't know him. Right, and, and so maybe it's because there was such a connection so between he and so many other people, people mention, in his circle and so that, forth that where there are a lot of people I could mention that were went to other schools and around the area, but not Cleveland High, that he wouldn't know. He knew a couple of my friends he didn't know all of them, so that happens. He has that happens in, over the know. years. He has introduced me to a number of his professional colleagues, either peers or students or people that were mentors in his professional life. But it barely scratches the surface of his circle, and he will bring up names of people that I've never heard of, and he insists. Right. That I know who they are and what no they did and when they did it right. and who Same did it. With, right. With baseball players, I have no idea what he's talking about. Right. Same thing with scores with baseball players, the teams he's played on, yeah. scores of games that I don't have any it's, idea. It's yeah. What he's talking about. He remembers all these. Things it's like it's it strange and. Two minutes ago. He remembers yeah. all these things yeah. like it happened two minutes ago. Really. We weren't there. Yeah. But yet he doesn't right. remember that he we weren't stuff. there. I don't Maybe he wishes it but was I don't know where he hallucinates this stuff. Well, you know, maybe he wishes it were so, so therefore it is. But well, there's probably some wishful thinking question. and probably do you a little bit of there? asking the question, it's, it's stated as a fact, but do you remember a being a there? It's, there it's, it's stated says, as a fact, but uh, yet there's a, a scenario there, there that kind of says, uh, were you there? Do you remember when we did this and uh, we were together on this date and we met so, and when we went to the Imperial Club and we saw Ike and Tina Turner? Well, I remember going there. I remember seeing Ike and Tina Turner. I remember going to see Bob Cuban and the Inmen and all that stuff. I can't remember whether it was with Terry or not. Exactly. But we were probably there at different times. Yeah. Okay. I think a lot of that is like a crossover type thing with friends and people. Right. But when he mentions names from the past, from uh, the grade school, from the high school, 
and, I, and a lot of them, I must say, I recognize the name, and I and it just rings a bell that I know that person, and I know that I was in the Cub Scouts with that person, or I played softball with. Do you ever get in a conversation with him while he's speaking to you? And he refers to you while he's speaking that to hasn't you happened to me. by the wrong and name. I'm awfully sorry for you. Well, that hasn't happened to me. You know and I'm Sons. awfully sorry for you. He's got my name right well, so far. Yeah. You, know you, <laughs> you know Terry Sons. <laughs> he's got my name right so far. Yeah. You know Terry you know Sons' name. How many times? Yeah. Phil. Philip. Yeah. Philip. Do you with know one L, I think. How yeah. many times I have been mm. called Phil? Oh my. You know what happened one time mm. when Phil was here? Wow. And you know what happened? He called One Phil time Fred. when Phil was here, he called Phil Fred. And I've heard him misspeak people's names. And I've heard him on several occasions, misspeak people's not names mine. on no. several and occasions, I, I, not just mine. I don't know if his mind is just and going I, I, in too many directions at once. I don't know if his mind is just are. going in too many directions I, I at once to keep it all straight, or uh, I, I frequently find myself. Uh, particularly as during events secretary. like this one, keeping him acting on as his social right. secretary, on track, on focus, keeping him on schedule, right. on track, on focus. Mm -hmm. We have to leave here right. now because you were supposed to be somewhere 20 minutes ago, right. and you get right. lost in these conversations. You've got to stop. Let's go. Right. And the older he gets, I find the that... And that the older he, he gets, the secretary. worse he gets, somebody and that kick him in the butt or something. he needs a social secretary or it's, somebody to kick him in the butt or something that. and keep him on when track. Comes to Phoenix, mm -hmm. it, 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 do you get a sense of that? Yes. When he comes to Phoenix, is by, by you, is he like that? Yes. Uh, Lynn and I, and but, Lynn, but, Lynn uh, is such a fantastic wife. Uh, Lynn and I, and uh, uh, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn is such a fantastic uh, wife because she she keeps me centered on the fact that, you know, you... And you know you're when you're with Terry, forever. it's a wonderful thing. So you have and, a great time. And you know you're not going to have this forever. Just so you have flow. a great time. Mm -hmm. You Whatever. just let it go. Okay. Just let it flow. Yes. And Whatever. And yes. That's the and same and thing and I okay. talk about with my wife. Yes. Yes. And and yes. Uh, and that and that's right Terry because these are these are precious moments. Uh, Terry does make those because those mistakes probably because there's a lot going through his head and he's jumping. He's got a what my wife would call a grasshopper mind. It's a grasshopper mind. Okay. Excellent analysis. Don't you like that? I like that. It's a grasshopper mind because it's like he will start something. This, and then yeah. go over and, here, and, 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 and then he'll go there, and then he'll come back to this. To yeah. myself. I get yeah. And, 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 and yeah. some people, and I have a tendency to do that myself. I get off track, focus, and she looks okay? at me, and then she gets so, me back so on point tend to do of what that. I'm supposed to focus, but, okay? So, know, so people tend to name, do that. The name is but, interesting. You, you touched you know, upon something there. Because the name, the name is yeah. interesting. You touched upon something there because he calls me Johnny. And, and my I've never name been is called John Johnny. White. It's spelled J-O-N. And, my life except by and my I've never family. been called Johnny it's in true. my life except uh, by my family. Johnny. Uh, it's my true. Uh, my mom and dad, dad called me Johnny. Living in Arizona. Uh, my cousin, Johnny. still to this day, still he, alive, living Johnny, in Arizona, calls me Johnny. Else that knows he, me in Terry, calls me Johnny. But and through college, everybody else that knows me in business and through college calls me John. Well, I, and that, so he must 50, consider himself. That's going back. That's going well, back 50, 60 years for that Johnny. How do you hear him refer to me? When he gets the name right. Gee, I don't know if I have it. In his lucid Freddy, moments when he gets yes. the name right. Gee, I don't know if I have it. He doesn't call you Freddie, does he? Yes. Not all the time. He calls you Freddie instead of Fred. There are that comes up sometime, but not all the time. There are two people in the world who call me that. Him and his sister, who got it from him. Yeah. Yeah. I do not know why. Yeah. My name yeah. is Fred, F R E D, yeah. not Frederick, right. not and, right. nothing, just yeah. well, plain old Fred. Right. And right. Well, it I used to aggravate me because I hate it. Right. But now, as you said, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not worth anyway. getting excited about well, I, the, I think the moments are too short anyway. To and well, I, with it. I think there's a little See, bit of meth an, method to madness here. It's it's a. And I think See, I think it's an, do, yeah. an enduring you refer to quality, like that. and I think that when you you, uh, re yeah. you refer to somebody you're, like it's that, bringing it a little bit uh, close, the relationship a little you're, bit closer. It's bringing okay. it a little bit close, the relationship a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't, say, I don't correct him on it. Bob, I don't correct my cousin. Right. I don't say, 
Well, I remember Bob, as a my name is John. Right. To, you know, 10, 12, Well, I remember it as old. a throwback back to, you know, 10, 12, time, sure. 15 years old. It's just that I hadn't heard it in a long time. But I think that's one of the qualities Terry, has, that he, that he, that has, that qualities Terry has, is that he he, he has a, a fondness for that. that close, and and I think he's just, that's a, there's a message there that yeah, there's a close, close relationship. Perhaps By him calling you that. Yeah, yes. perhaps okay. he feels like yes. he can relax and be less formal. Yeah, it yes. really is. And, it, it's, so, it's yes. and that's good. He, he needs that more of that. Yeah, it really is. Really and it, it's, it's an interesting thing you ask back, about that because I thought about it many times, and you're the first one to ask about that. Back, Backing up a little bit, <laughs> when you were the young kids, how much contact or association did you have with Terry's sister, Kate? Oh, golly. Almost back as far as him. sister. Kay was always and, there, uh, and she was always around the little very sister. Close relationship and uh, the, the they have a very close the relationship because the, the dancing that he new. enjoys, the swing dancing and everything, I mean, they were this dancing, is nothing new. Which was very I know this for a fact. I mean, they were dancing, like dancing which was very unusual, I thought, thought in high school, to be like dancing partners. He would think nothing of asking Kay to dance, his sister, to Oldies Rock, which is Oldies Rock now, but back then it was New Rock, Right. at high school dances, and think nothing of it. When most people say, oh, gee, you're going to dance with your sister? Yeah. Exactly. Am I right? Exactly. He yes. There's he didn't care. Bond there, he enjoyed it. She enjoyed it. I, I There's a very close bond there, I, I never mm -hmm. which is terrific. I'm an only child. I, I think it's very I interesting. Now, I, yeah, I never experienced too. that because I'm an only so child. I don't know what that's so I didn't have a brother or sister. Like, yeah, me too. Terry exactly. See? So I don't know what that's like. Dancing, but I guess Terry was a dancer and enjoyed dancing. And I guess his favorite and best partner from the very get go was his own sister and not a girlfriend. Clearly, I think that comes from the fact that Kay was able to teach him, and Kay is, without a doubt, a far, sorry Terry, a far superior dancer to Terry. Uh, Kay can even actually on occasion make me look pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but I think Terry enjoyed that dancing with her because it allowed him right. and forced him to get better. Right. And it's another one of those deals where if he is going to participate, he is going to challenge himself to excel at that activity. Right. And in this case, it's dancing, so he wants... Right. What he, he considers the best yeah. available and, partner, and, and that's Kay. Can do that. Right. He and, wants and, to be pushed. Uh, yeah. And 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 Kay can do that. And and uh, also to move on. And of course, the, that gave him confidence. Uh, well, you know, I think ninth, also yeah. to move grade, on so beyond I, the gonna, uh, well, you know the ninth, tenth, eleventh grade, and so I, forth, I, and enjoy it more. I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'm going to come back to that. There's another confidence statement. There's another car sitting here on the table in front of us that that you see is. This is was my first new car, a 1966 and this is an exact Pontiac replica GTO of a 1966 Pontiac, Pontiac GTO in the exact and color that I bought. I ordered that car in the summer and after we got out of high school. I ordered that car in the summer after we got out of high school and picked it up sometime September, around October, oh, September or October of 1960, well I guess I picked it up around November of 66 because it, you could order it as early as September and, and it came in I, I in mm. probably November. To pick that car up at the I, I took Terry's sister and to pick that car up at the dealership although some people and, hallucinated, Kay and I never dated. although some people hallucinated, Kay and I never yeah. dated. And I would go we were more bumming buddies. Car. And yeah, she and I would Terry go riding around in this car a lot. Kay but when Terry would come to town, Kay was horrified. Terry would take her place because <laughs> Terry would take her place in the front seat. <laughs> and as you oh, mentioned boy. before, she then reverted back to being the little sister that was always well, this hanging around. Seats in a console, so well, this car had bucket no seats seat in a console, so 
So she there was no the middle console, seat for her to sit in. So she would ride on the console because it was beneath right. her dignity to mm -hmm. ride well, in the back Terry seat. I, wouldn't happen. Uh, right. So many others did well, Terry and I, uh, uh, as so many others did in St. Louis, uh, would cruise Emporium, a, a local restaurant emporium steak and shake it's a semi-national chain there in a number of states but you would drive in the steak and shake lot and drive around the building until you could find a parking place and it was the place to see and be seen and the last thing you wanted to do was be seen with the little sister hanging obviously around. This car had, uh, <laughs> so obviously this car so had uh, an excess amount of horsepower. So when I, I would drive a onto the lot with Steak and Shake, and Kay would I would give it a little extra gas and, and Kay would fly between the seats into the back seat and land on the floor because she's such a tiny little Terry thing this car could easily overpower her the seats and of course then down. Terry would reach around and on the floor reach between so the seats no and hold her down her as we on the floor <laughs> so that no and one would, would see her as we cruised around oh brother and she would be wouldn't. screaming bloody murder at Terry to let her up let and he up just wouldn't because there's he was no relentless he would not let her up that he was going to because be there's no way in hell that he was going to be happen. seen cruising steak and shake so, with his little sister. You know, that, wasn't going to happen. That somehow so, has set you know, that, I think that somehow has set that he has part of the tone for their relationship, been somewhat dominant in their relationship that he has well, uh, been somewhat dominant in their relationship I mean, over the well, years. Well, it's funny because, right um, I mean, all oh, I yes. could think about when with, you're telling with, the stories is this with is with right Mackenzie out of Phillips. American Graffiti. Oh, yes. Yeah. With, 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 with Mackenzie Phillips. Yeah. Sitting next to, it was called Paul the Matt or whatever his name was. Yeah. Driving, you know, and... He didn't this want to be with This could have been he, our story. You know, this yeah. like I don't, I don't, sister. don't look at me. This could have been our story. And this is my, it's ago. like my yeah. little sister here. <laughs> yeah. The real thing. And it only yeah, happened, happened 40 movie, years ago. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. The real thing. Yeah, this happened. Not a movie. In the, in the fall and winter yeah, of 1966. It's amazing. Yeah, it's an absolutely true story. And if it happened once, yeah. Uh, it's a testament to Kay's naivete or gullibility or whatever you want to call it because well, if this happened once it probably here. happened 25 right. times right well the steak and shake story here uh, has has a lot to do with the the Midwestern with steak and shake being in the Midwest and St. Louis being such a major market for steak and shake we really didn't realize I mean I guess at the time how much fun we were really having <laughs> exactly. compared to a lot of kids exactly. the closeness and what the kids do today because this cruising and we didn't we didn't even refer to it as cruising I don't think. I, I we never just, heard the term until that, here later. that was like an older thing as kind of a buzzword catchword but when you drive through steak and shake I don't think uh, and I wish I could see old films of that sort of activity should somebody should have been out on Gravoy or Kings Highway or somebody mm -hmm. taking films because to see the tremendous amount of cars of high quality really nifty where po polished wonderful looking cars and you wouldn't believe fast souped fast, up hot rods great machines clean as a whistle not a speck of dirt on them continually going in and out of of the driveways and I, with and I blo think blocks uh, way down the block of people trying to get Terry truly enjoyed being part of that scene right right he, we were he, part of that culture and that that yeah, ties us all together exactly. with Terry Terry ate it up mm -hmm. we all loved it but that made us closer oh yes than just getting together to play video games or occasionally hey how you doing we'll meet at a restaurant right. this was like 20 friends this was a seeing lifestyle. each other every Friday and Saturday night. Exactly. It was a happening. Exactly. It was great, and he loved it. We all loved it. And that, that, that really, you'll never forget that stuff. I want to go back to, to the comment you made a minute ago about confidence. Do you ever get the sense, and, and, and there's a reason I'm asking you this, that do you ever get the sense that in spite of all the success, and the acclaim and the financial success, the professional success, in spite of the bravado, do you get any sense that Terry 
really is lacking in self-confidence? Well, I don't know, Fred, whether it's a lack, uh, lack of self-confidence or whether there are a couple things happening uh, that I see. I think Terry is very, very confident about his work and his radiology and what he knows right is right. Mm -hmm. And this is a fact, and it's a scientific fact. I think in some other things, it might be testing the water to see what you think about something or what I see, because he asks a lot of questions that's always along the lines of, what do you think about this? Or do you agree with me? He always says that. Yes. Do you agree, John? Yeah, what, what do you think, John? What, do you see it that way? I think there's a certain amount of not necessarily lack of confidence, but reassurance. There might be some second guessing going on with some of the things that he does yeah. uh, that he's not 100% comfortable with. But the with. second guessing, in my opinion, is second guessing of himself. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I believe, and, and we alluded to this a little earlier, uh, given the personality of his dad and given the dad's expectations uh, and Terry's, mm -hmm. Terry's belief of his dad's expectations, I think to this day Terry is still trying to convince himself that he has succeeded in life to the level that would make his father happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that he's ever going to achieve that in his own mind. Right. I, I right. think he drives himself and drives himself and drives himself as if no matter what he does, it's never going to be enough. And th that's the way I view this and I'm wondering do you see that or oh yes yes I do but I see it not only in Terry but if you take examples like a uh, a Peyton Manning a phenomenal quarterback mm -hmm. they're now Super Bowl champions can't get any better than that he's a great guy his father of course was Archie Manning sure and his brother's Eli Manning well I could see where Peyton Manning obviously wanted to win a Super Bowl uh, Peyton Manning wasn't necessarily what New Orleans Saints wasn't that good of a team. Uh, didn't have the stellar career Peyton Manning has, but he's trying to overachieve. Maybe out of passion, but maybe going, uh, progressing, pushing the generation mm -hmm. further up the ladder, which I frankly I believe in. You know, I want my kids to be better than me mm -hmm. and go better and higher and stronger. Same thing with Eli. Eli's chasing his brother Peyton. So I see this trait, I think, in, in a lot of people like this that may be going in the same direction as a profession. Mm -hmm. It could be football, baseball, you, Barry Bonds, Bobby Bonds. You know, a lot of, a lot of baseball players, sure. the, the Alou, uh, you know, uh, Philippe yeah, Alou, family, Matty yes. Alou, Moises Alou. Right. They all want to be better than their father. But I think you're right. I think, uh, and I don't think, you know what, I, I don't think that can ever be achieved. No. I think it's like playing the perfect golf game. It's never going to happen. Exactly. You cannot achieve that level of being perfect. I and, agree. I agree. And, and, but he's gone way beyond, I think, what his dad ever thought he would do. And he should, oh, he should, uh, yeah. he should enjoy it. He should enjoy his success and what he's achieved. Well, I know that you have encouraged him to take a more relaxed approach to things. <laughs> and I know that I certainly have. Right. Uh, and we're down to a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and I guess to sum it up, if I had to peg Terry, it would be a driven, methodical uh, perfectionist who refuses to compromise and refuses to accept less than the absolute best. And that can be abrasive to some people, mm -hmm. but it's the absolute driving factor in Terry's personality. Well, and my last comment, uh, since we're running out of time here on tape, is that I think Terry's best quality, far beyond even being a great radiologist and chiropractor, is that 
he's a he's the greatest person I've ever seen with relationships of friends. Mm-hmm. He values friendship more than anything I've ever seen anybody yes. else achieve. I agree. He he values uh, close friendship, and that's that's paramount in wanting to see people, see how they're doing, follow up with them, and not too many people like that in this world. And, and yes, and the. The weaknesses of other people in relationships, which we all have to some extent, never cease to amaze him. Mm -hmm. That they don't live up to his expectation of what the friendship should be, and it disturbs him so much that Mm -hmm. he can't cope with it sometimes. Right. It's just such a shock that everyone Mm -hmm. doesn't treat people the way he would. Right, right. Well, thanks for a great interview. John, thank I think you. you did a marvelous job for bringing all this information out, and I thank you for your time. Oh, thank it you. It was wonderful. I enjoyed, enjoyed having you.